Okay. Um, I'm not really good at reading the, the comments and questions. Uh, so what I will try to do is after every couple slides, I'll try to stop uh, and see if there are any questions. And Hollis, if you can tell if you see any questions come up on the chat. I'll monitor. Uh, just let me know because I'd like to make this as, as interactive as, as possible. So let me first introduce myself. Uh, I'm Phil Warren. Uh, I'm with the Marine Mammal Center and have been for about 15 years. My wife and I started doing rescues along the Sonoma coast about 15 years ago. And except for uh, a young lady that was out at the Marine Lab, we were the only ones doing rescues along the coast. Uh, we now have 15 well-trained uh, marine mammal rescuers along the coast, and we've just added four new volunteers. So we're now very well equipped to respond to the calls uh, along the coast. Let me share my screen. Okay, here we go. What I will try to do as we talk is to tell you a little bit about the marine mammals that you're likely to see along the coast. And this little fella here is an elephant seal. Uh, we're going to see lots of those along the coast, and we'll talk a little later in the presentation about why we see them on the coast. But this is just a lead in to um, what we're going to talk about today. And I'm going to first talk about the Marine Mammal Center itself and the mission of the Marine Mammal Center. I'll talk about why marine mammals strand and what the definition of a stranding is. Talk about what we need to do to respond to an animal that's stranded. And we'll talk a little bit about who rescues animals, how do we do it, and what happens to them after we rescue those animals. So let's talk about the Marine Mammal Center. This is a facility that is about 45 years old. We took our kids there in the late 70s and it was um, a, a little wire fence and some bathtubs and they had just started bringing in marine mammals. Uh, now it is the largest marine mammal hospital in the world. It is very well recognized throughout marine mammal veterinarians throughout the world and we train lots of marine mammal veterinarians and we're an example to many other facilities across the world as, as to an, an effective marine mammal rescue and rehabilitation organization. Our mission early on was primarily rescue and rehabilitation of marine mammals. But that has evolved as we've grown, and now we're focused on advanced global ocean conservation and through our, the, the strengths that we have, which are marine mammal rescue and rehabilitation. And we do an incredible amount of scientific research and education. Uh, on the average, we publish 10 to 15 peer reviewed scientific papers every year. We educate thousands, tens of thousands of school children every year in the conservation of marine mammals. Just some ideas of what we're doing. The picture on the left is a rescue of a sea lion. In the center is a, 
animal that is in one of our surgeries and in the right is another California sea lion. The number at the bottom, 24 hour hotline, 415-289-SEAL. That number is answered normally during daylight hours directly by the staff at the center. Uh, when the center is closed, that number goes to an answering service, which is trained to take the call and decide whether it's an emergency. And for instance, we will get a call sometimes at eight or nine o'clock at night where somebody says, I was picnicking on the beach today and, and I saw an animal resting on the beach. Well, it's, I'm, I'm happy that they called us and alerted us to a marine mammal that was in quote, stranded on the beach except it's not one that we're going to get our rescuers out of bed and make an emergency response to. We will head out the next morning and check it out. On the other hand, if we get a call at 10 o'clock at night that says there's a sea lion walking down Highway 1 uh, near uh, South Salmon Creek Beach, we're going to have somebody out there as quick as possible to deal with that. So that's a 24 hour hotline number that you can reach us with both emergency and non-emergency calls. We also do research. We have a, a lab at the facility that can very quickly look uh, at blood work and other things for the animals that we bring into the surgery. We also do a lot of research of bringing in school age kids and giving them a chance to see both what goes on, but also learn a lot about marine mammal health. Let me take a break for just a second and ask if there's any questions. There's nothing in the chat, Bill. Okay, thanks. Okay, we cover 600 miles of California coastline, and that 600 miles is shown on the right uh, from the northern end of Mendocino County to the southern end of San Luis Obispo County. And in that area, we have our main facility in Sausalito, as well as triage facilities in Monterey Bay and San Luis Obispo. And these facilities allow us to bring in animals picked up in the southern end of the range, triage them overnight, and then move them to our main hospital uh, in Sausalito. We also have a facility in Hawaii that is designed specifically de to deal with the Hawaiian monk seal. We have about 85 full-time staff and 1,400 volunteers. And we have more than 100,000 people that come through our facilities every year. Now, unfortunately with COVID, our facility hasn't been open for almost two years to the general public. However, when it does open and looking at our website would be a good way for you to figure that out. It is a fantastic place to visit. As I said before, it's the largest marine hospital in the world and it's filled with educational material. Uh, the visit is free. There are docents, well, you, you can pay for a, an individual tour, but there are docents throughout the facility that can tell you about what goes on there. Lots of educational exhibits. Love to have you visit. We're in the Golden Gate National Recreation Area. If you know where Rodeo Beach is, um, it is, some of you may know the one lane tunnel that goes underneath Highway 101. It's almost under the Robin Williams tunnel and perpendicular to it. Uh, so it goes from Sausalito out toward uh, the west. And if you just go through that tunnel and go as far west as you can, we're right there by Rodeo Beach. Okay, these are our core patients and we'll talk a little bit more about them 
so that you can recognize these animals. Top left is a California sea lion. Next to the right is a northern elephant seal. The next one is a harbor seal, and many of you are familiar with that because you deal with the seal watch at the end of the Russian River. The last one on the right is a fur seal, and I don't know whether it's a Guadalupe fur seal or a northern fur seal. These guys are, are relatively rare. They are pelagic animals, which means they don't normally come to the coast unless there's something wrong with them. As, as opposed to sea lions, harbor seals, and elephant seals, which you'll see lounging around on beaches and rocks. If we see a fur seal on the beach, that normally tells us that there's something wrong with it. They're also interesting little fellows in that, that kind of the rule of thumb for rescuers is, if you see a sea lion on the beach and, and he's not feeling deathly sick, he will normally run from you. If you see a fur seal on the beach, he will normally run at you. And, and we kind of think of them as, as Tasmanian devils. When they, when they come at you, they're all teeth and they're nasty little fellows. And so rescuing a fur seal is always an exciting event. Lower left corner is something that you're probably not going to see along the coast. And that's a Hawaiian monk seal. So if you see that guy in the lower left, that makes news uh, along the California coast. The next one over is the sea otter, southern sea otter. Uh, we are not the primary responsibility for sea otters. Uh, that's mostly Monterey Bay Aquarium who has the expertise in sea otters, but we do have facilities to house sea otters and we will often take excess sea otters if the Monterey Aquarium doesn't have the facility to take them. And our we don't see sea otters along the Sonoma coast very often. I actually have a photograph taken by a friend of mine who sails in Bodega Bay and it's a picture of a sea otter uh, with Bodega Head in the background. So I know it's legitimate. Uh, so we see them up here once in a great while, but not very often. But we do see lots of them in Monterey and San Luis Obispo. And so we do have facilities to care for them and we are trained to rescue them. And they are all teeth as well. And, and rescuing a sea otter is, is also an experience that I'm happy I don't have to get involved with. Uh, we do see on the right, the two cetaceans. We see occasional cetaceans uh, I rescued a, a northern right whale dolphin off of Dillon Beach many years ago that had a broken rostrum. And it was an animal that, that couldn't survive but was still alive. Uh, we did take it down to the Marine Mammal Center where they were able to euthanize it. But it's the only live cetacean that I've dealt with uh, along the coast. But we, we do see lots of uh, cetaceans out in the water. So what is a stranded animal? So a stranded animal is any dead marine mammal on the shore or in the water. It is also a live marine mammal on the shore and unable to return, the and unable to, return to the water or in need of medical attention. So a sea lion resting on a rock is not a stranded animal. An elephant seal that's laying on the beach molting is not a stranded animal. And live marine mammals in the water, but unable to return to its natural habitat on its own or without help. So normally we would not deal with, with marine mammals in the water. But if, for instance, we find one that is, that is badly injured or or some other possibility it might be entangled in fishing gear or something like that, then we would rescue that. And we operate under uh, a permit by National Marine Fisheries, uh, NOAA, 
and they tell us what we are by law allowed to interact with. So we do need to follow those rules and, and we're responsible to make sure that we, we uh, deal with our, um, the things that we are allowed to do by permit. So why do animals strand? Well, there's some pictures there of, of a sea lion and an elephant seal and a harbor seal. And, and I think the guy on the lower left is a fur seal that I picked up on South Salmon Creek Beach entangled in a, in a fishing gear. And then there's another sea lion on the lower right. Um, they could be sick. Animals, marine mammals get diseases like leptospirosis and dogs get leptospirosis. It may not be exactly the same strain, but it's a common disease uh, around dogs as well as marine mammals. And another good reason to keep your dog away from uh, marine mammals on the beach, whether they're live or whether they're a carcass. You've probably all heard about domoic acid and, and the neurotoxin that's involved in the closing down of, of some of the uh, crab fisheries and so forth. Um, marine mammals, primarily sea lions, but not only sea lions, get domoic acid. They get it from eating shellfish and other small fish. Uh, it actually affects their hippocampus and can cause them to go into seizures and can cause a loss of spatial recognition. Uh, you've probably seen over the years pictures of sea lions that have been rescued out in the Central Valley and other places where they don't belong. And oftentimes it's just because they, they become spatially lost uh, and, and it, it's a result of, of the neurotoxin uh, involved in their hippocampus and the brain. They do get parasites. Uh, there is a high level of cancer uh, in California sea lions. It's something that the Marine Mammal Center has studied for more than 20 years. Uh, and, and we're looking at, at the, the prevalence and the changing in prevalence of cancer in sea lions. And, and they get malnourished. Uh, you know that, that the ocean temperature has gone up and down along the coast over the years. And oftentimes when the temperature gets warm, the good food fish move further out into colder water and make it difficult for the near coast feeding marine mammals like harbor seals and sea lions, make it difficult for them to find food. So we end up with, with years when there's unusually warm ocean temperatures, we often have a lot more strandings due to, to malnourishment. We do also occasionally see trauma we can see ship strikes. We can see fish hooks or fishing gear. Uh, we can see gunshot wounds in animals. And, and as you can see in the guy in the lower left, uh, we can see uh, entanglement in fishing gear. Sea lions in particular are very curious. And if they find a net or something like that, they'll stick their nose in it. And if it gets wrapped around in their neck, they don't back out very well. So they end up wearing this, this uh, net. But there can be other reasons why animals strand or appear to strand. And one of them is molting. Elephant seals, all, all animals molt. Elephant seals go through uh, what we call a catastrophic molt. And that means once a year, they haul out on the beach and their fur comes off. And sometimes a little bit of skin comes off as well. It looks to me like a very uncomfortable process. Uh, sometimes it can take as much as a week uh, and, and they can look terrible. They have bloody spots on them. They have snot coming out of their nose. They have tears coming out of their eyes. Uh, they have these bloody spots. And, and I've had people tell me there's this dead seal on the beach. And 
I, I know it's dead because I saw it take its last breath. But elephant seals can hold their breath. The, the record that I remember was two hours and four minutes because they can dive to 5,000 feet. So you gotta be able to hold your breath for a long time to, to deal with diving that deep. So occasionally you'll see an elephant seal that'll just go, <gasps> and then it won't appear to breathe for another few minutes. So these people are now convinced that they saw the elephant seal take its last breath. And because of all of the other physical signs, it surely looks dead. And we'll get that report and my wife and I will look at each other and say, oh, a healthy elephant seal. And we'll go out and sure enough, it's a molting elephant seal. And it's doing just fine. It just wants to be left alone. There is no reason to rescue the animal. And rescuing an animal puts it through a lot of trauma to be hauled into a cage, into a net, and then put into the back of a truck and taken to Sausalito. <laughs> Of course, they don't know that when they get to Sausalito, they get free food and lots of care, but it's still a traumatic process. And we don't like to do that unless we have to. So with elephant seals on the beach and we see, you know, a half a dozen or a dozen of them a year, we'll put up some markers around them and try to protect them from the general public and just watch them until the process is finished and until they trundle back into the ocean. We also see the occasional elephant seal pup. And, and we think it may be one of the first times these pups are in the ocean. With elephant seals, they're typically born in the early part of the year, usually January and February. They weigh about 70 pounds when they're born and they stay with their mother for about five weeks on the beach. And there's a rookery at Point Reyes and there's one at Año Nuevo. And there's also one down uh, by Hearst Castle. And, and so they've been with their mom for about five weeks. They haven't been in the water. They haven't had any solid food. And, it, and, and by this time, all the males have left. Most of the males have left. And about the end of five weeks, all of the moms leave and they leave these pups on the beach that haven't been in the water and haven't had solid food and they're left to fend for themselves. And it's kind of like taking your 18 month old and setting it out on the back deck and saying, good luck, kid. So they start for the first week or so, they just kind of mill around on the beach waiting for mom to come back and feed them. Eventually they figure out that mom's not coming back and they start to root around in the tide pools. And this is how they learn to swim, <coughs> excuse me. And it's how they learn to eat. And they have little claws on the end of their front flippers. And you will occasionally see them pick up things like kelp and rocks and stuff like that and put it up to their mouth and try it. And eventually they figure out that they can eat some of the stuff that they find in tide pools and that they can swim and that they can hold their breath and get under the water. So at some point they decide to explore the ocean. And that's when we start seeing them on our beaches. Uh, if, if the little guy left Point Reyes Rookery, he may have been out swimming for 25 miles and he gets to Doran Beach and thinks, well, I spent, <coughs> the last eight to 10 weeks on the beach and it was kind of nice and it was a nice place to rest. So I'm gonna haul out on the beach and rest. And we'll get a call about a marine mammal on the beach and go out and sure enough, it's a little elephant seal. By this time, he's back down to birth weight even though at the end of five weeks, being born at 70 pounds, at the end of five weeks, he now weighs 300 pounds. <coughs> he will go back down to birth weight because mom has left and he's on his own to try to figure out how to eat. So we'll end up with this 70 or 80 pound elephant seal on the beach. And again, we do what we prefer to do, which is not rescue. We will mark them. We use a, a crayon to mark them. It's a wax crayon that, that uh, farmers use to mark their cattle. It stays pretty well in the, in the water environment. 
And so we'll mark them so we know that if he leaves the beach and comes back, we recognize him. Uh, we get probably 10 of those a year and rarely do we see that animal again. Almost inevitably, the next morning the animal's gone. And, and maybe one out of 10, we will see it get picked up somewhere else along the coast. And if they continue to strand, then we think, you know, maybe they're just not getting it and maybe they do have to be rescued. But the vast majority of time, they come out, they rest overnight, they head back into the water and they're gone. Let me take a break for questions again, if there are any questions. <laughs> Bill, um, when is the Marine Mammal Center going to be reopening to the to the public? I, I don't know. You know, like everything else with COVID, we keep pushing it back. You know, we had great thoughts about opening up in, in March or April of last year. And then, you know, we, we ended up with another round. So I, I don't know. The, the, the best thing to do is to look at their... Uh, website, which is marinemammalcenter.org, uh, and just keep an eye on, on when they open because they have not told any of us what their plans are yet. Bill, yeah. there, there, is a, um, there is a link to keep in contact with them, and they do send out an, an email, right? Uh, I, I don't know. That's possible. Okay. Well, I just, I just signed up for the email and they'll alert us when it opens. They on the, it said on the page. So okay, hopefully great. that'd be an easy way to keep track. Great. Great. Good. Thanks. Also, I was wondering, um, I know that the Academy of Sciences um, has a collection of dead marine mammals and their collection of Guadalupe fur seals has risen you know, exponentially in the past couple of years. And do you um, see Guadalupe's that are sick or by the time they're, they wind up on a beach and stranded, are they usually deceased? We, we see both Northerns and Guadalupe's. And, and I know that the populations of both of them has grown over the years. Uh, fur seals were pretty much hunted to extinction, uh, probably in the early 1900s. And their population has come back. And we do see progressively more fur seals every year. Uh, we, we do get the occasional fur seal carcass, uh, but we, we also get live fur seals. And, and more often than not, the fur seal strandings occur in the November, December, January timeframe. They're typically born in June and they're usually weaned at about six months. And it's usually that weaning process that, that they've gotten separated from their mom maybe a little too early and they end up uh, either picking up disease or just being malnourished and end up on the beach. And so, so probably our peak time for rescue of, of fur seals is November, December, January. Thank you. There are no further questions in the chat. Okay. Um, the Marine Mammal, we are part of the Marine Mammal Stranding Network. And that was part of the Marine Mammal Protection Act which was signed by Congress in 1972 and made it illegal to harm, harass, or approach any marine mammal. And that includes dead marine mammals. Dead marine mammals are also covered by the Marine Mammal Protection Act. And we are one of 40 organizations authorized to rescue and rehabilitate marine mammals. We are the largest and we do uh, a lot of things other than rescue. As I told you, we do research and we do education, uh, but there are approximately 40 organizations. There is, there is uh, organizations in Alaska and Seattle 
and Oregon. There's one at Crescent City on the north coast. And then as we go down the coast, there's one in Santa Barbara, Los Angeles, Orange County, and San Diego. <laughs> Uh, we cooperate with those, we exchange people, we exchange information, uh, and we work very well with all those organizations uh, on the West Coast and the Gulf Coast and the East Coast. If you see a marine mammal, keep a safe distance. Now, I, you know, in, in one of the earlier presentations, we said 50 yards away. Uh, we in this particular slide, we say 50 feet away. Uh, it's sometimes pretty hard if you've got a 30 foot wide beach and you're walking down the beach and there's a marine mammal on the beach. Uh, it's sometimes hard to, to keep that distance away, but we ask you to do everything you can to avoid disturbing that marine mammal. Uh, and in particular, keeping the dogs on a leash uh, which, because dogs will, will charge these things and, and they're deadly to small marine mammals and they may be in danger from large marine mammals. If you see a marine mammal, call the center's hotline 415-289-SEAL. Uh, let us know about it. If, if it's on the beach, it's, it may or may not be unusual. As I say, uh, elephant seals may not need rescuing uh, if they're either molting or if they're a little one that's just laying out for the day to rest. To rest. But we do, we do feel the need to respond because we need, even if we decide they don't need rescuing, we do need to work out a way to protect them from the general public, putting up signage, putting up, uh, 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 tape around them to, to prevent people from walking into them because a, an elephant seal can look a lot like a rock. If you're out on the beach and, and you are so taken in by the view of the ocean, you just see this lump on the beach and, and it's almost easy to stumble over it. Uh, so that's the reason why we'll put up some sticks with some um, um, fluorescent tape just to let people know that there's something going on there. So we'd like to hear from you, even if it doesn't look like it's a rescue situation. Now, you don't need to call us and tell us that there's a harbor seal at the end of the Russian River, because we kind of know that. But if you find a harbor seal lying on another beach, uh, let us know and we'll come take a look just to make sure that, that we'll, we'll do an evaluation Hopefully it doesn't need to be rescued, but we do need to keep, keep an eye on it. Also, if it's a dead marine mammal, we'd like to hear about it. The, and later in the presentation, I'll give you the number of California Academy of Sciences, but Cal Academy is the one who is responsible for the dead marine mammals along the Sonoma County coast. Um, and, uh, we will forward that information to them. Uh, they're the ones that will decide whether they need to come out uh, and investigate the animal, perhaps do a necropsy, or even potentially take the carcass into Cal Academy because their objective is to understand why marine mammals die. So if it's a carcass, let us know either by calling the Marine Mammal Center uh, or by calling the California Academy of Sciences directly, and I'll give you that number later. If you can take a picture, send the picture to rescue at tmmc.org. Uh, that helps us greatly to have a picture. Uh, so if you will send that to us with as much information as you can about location, and a description of the issues, and we will have someone respond to it. If you see that animal on the beach, the initial observations we'd like to hear from you are, 
what you think the animal is, and and you'd be surprised how many elephant seals that we get reports of that turn out to be a sea lion or something else. But I think most of you guys uh, have enough experience to know a harbor seal from an elephant seal from a sea lion. Length and size, that helps us because we will bring equipment with us in case we need to rescue. And we need to know something about the length and size and potential weight uh, in order to decide what kind of equipment we're going to bring with us. Color helps any visible injuries or markings. The injuries are particularly important to us. Uh, markings, as I told you, we mark uh, elephant steels, for example, when uh, we find them on the beach and we put them on watch. We mark them so that if, if they do return to the beach, uh, a day or two or a few days later, we can recognize that particular elephant seal. If an elephant seal is, has been in the Marine Mammal Center for any reason, if any marine mammal has been into the Marine Mammal Center for any reason, they're also tagged. Uh, elephant seals and harbor seals are tagged on their rear flippers. Uh, sea lions and fur seals are tagged on their front flippers. And if you can see a tag and the color of the tag, that helps us. It's generally too hard to get close enough to an animal to read their tag number uh, unless you have a good telephoto lens. That would be helpful to us, but not terribly important. And again, telling us something about where it is and what, what's around it. Uh, and, and we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, animals in rookeries. Any questions so far? Um, can marine mammals get COVID? Uh, I'm sorry, I missed that. Can marine mammals get COVID? Uh, I don't know. I, I Alice? Yes. There has been some research that says that marine mammals could be susceptible, but as of now, there have been no confirmed cases of um, COVID in marine mammals. There is an interesting article summarizing some studies related to um, wastewater, the danger of COVID in wastewater to marine mammals, and I'll post that in the chat. Great, thank you. Thanks, any other questions? Um, there is a question about confirming the email address to send photos to, and I think it's probably confusing because of the TMMC. Uh, let's see if I can back it up and find yeah, You're there. Yeah, you, um, you were there a minute ago. Yeah. It's rescue at tmmc.org. Uh, rescue at, it's, it's TMMC, which you can think of is the Marine Mammal Center. But TMMC is, so it's, it's rescue at tmmc.org. Our website is marinemammalcenter.org. Thank you, Phil. So once you've called it in, uh, it would be helpful to try to keep people and dogs at least 50 feet from the animal. I don't think most of you have signs and tape and stuff like that in your car as we do, but putting up signs and tape and other visible, vis visible markers like lines in the sand to pre create a protected area. And, and sometimes just you know, even when we put up some signs, we just take our foot and drag a circle in the sand around the animal just to give people an idea of, of how far to stay back. And then at some point, our volunteers will arrive with protective gear and rescue equipment to lead the response. And as you can see, one of Marine Mammal Center's trucks, uh, we do have to take a driving class um, to make sure that we're qualified to drive. And that's my wife in, in the middle of her driving class uh, at the Marine Mammal Center to drive the, the big truck. And, and a recent piece of news is we just got permission 
within the last few days to station a Marine Mammal Center truck at the Bodega Marine Lab. So for years, we've transported uh, animals in our personal SUVs, uh, but we now will, within the next couple of weeks, have a Marine Mammal Center pickup truck with all of the necessary equipment stationed out at the Marine Lab and accessible to all of our local volunteers, which should mean that we can get out and, and respond more quickly with complete equipment. So what do you tell people on the beach? Uh, well, we ask people to stay away 50 feet away. We talk to them about animals that can bite or carry diseases. Uh, it's a violation of the Marine Mammal Protection Act to harass, touch, feed, move, or otherwise disturb them. It is not unusual for healthy marine mammals to haul out on the beach. So the fact that there's a marine mammal on the beach does not necessarily mean that there's something wrong with it. It may just be laying there resting. People should not attempt to push or herd animals back into the water. If they are out of the water, they're out for a reason. And, and they should wait until marine mammal experts get there to decide what to do. Seals and sea lions do not need to be kept wet or fed while they're on the beach. Elephant seals sometimes go months without eating and, and swimming. Um, I, we had a, an elephant seal molting on Doran Beach a few years ago and, and I and and it had been there for a couple days and they as I said they tend to look awful they, they they're dried out they have some bloody spots on them uh, they got snot coming out of their nose and they're just they're awful looking animals and we go out and check on them a few times a day and my wife and I Walk, was just walking over the dunes to come out and check on a, a molting elephant seal. And we looked up and here are these two small kids with probably a 20 gallon bucket of water that they were hauling out there to pour on this elephant seal. And of course, our first reaction is to scream and yell, stop you stupid kids. You know, and well, my first reaction has, as, as I matured, is to go to them and say, thank you. Thank you for caring. Because they're not doing it because they're malicious. They're doing it because there's this marine mammal, and by marine, it must need to be in the water. It's laying there on the beach, and it's dry, and, and we care about it, and we're going to give it some water. And so the first reaction is, thank you, uh, but it doesn't need to have water poured on it. It's just fine. And, and so I, I think they left learning a bit of a lesson and having some fun. And, and that's a response that, that we've learned in a number of places where I, I get surprised once in a while, we'll be walking down the beach toward a, a stranded marine mammal. And, and, and we always have our uh, logo gear on it that says Marine Mammal Center Rescue and all this stuff. <clears throat> But uh, a few weeks ago, we were a marine mammal. And as, as we got up close enough to, to be able to evaluate it, people on a blanket 75 feet away stood up and started yelling at us. And I, we, we kind of stopped and walked around and went over to them. And I, and I think they were scared to death that we were... <laughs> that we were going to punch them. And I said, thank you, you did exactly what you should do. Thank you for keeping, you know, trying to keep people away. But we are trained Marine Mammal Center volunteers and we're here to evaluate. And they were relieved, uh, but it's, it, it is, it's an attitude that I think we all need to take is that, that most people are not interested in malicious acting. They're, they're interested in caring for these animals 
and we need to thank them even though what they're what they are doing in some cases may not be the right thing uh, one of the things that that we find is that we tell people particularly people with dogs to you know try to stay away from marine mammals and we say, you know, they carry diseases and they look at you and they say, yeah, and they keep walking toward it. And then you say, oh, and it can affect your dog. And then suddenly they'll stop and they'll look around and say, oh, it can affect my dog? Oh, well, we'll give it a wide berth then with our dog. So sometimes that little trick kind of works just to keep people uh, away from it. So there are times that we don't interfere and we can't. And this is a picture that was taken, I think, by one of the stewards volunteers up at uh, Goat Rock. And as you can see, there's a little harbor seal pup in there with a bird that's almost as big as the pup playing there. And we had gotten a call about uh, an abandoned harbor seal pup on Goat Rock Beach. And by the time we got up there, we saw this and you can see that the, the pup is there as well but all of a sudden there are other adults and perhaps babies up close to it and one of the things that that we are restricted in doing is we cannot interfere with an animal when it would cause stress on other marine mammals close by and in this case, we could certainly have picked up this harbor seal pup if it was out here all alone and at least evaluated whether it needed to be rescued. But when we got there, by this time, the, the crowd had moved down next to it. And it would have been clear that if we had approached that pup to evaluate it, it would have flushed the other animals back into the water. So we en ended up in order to, to inter in order to interact with that pup, we would need Noah's permission. And in fact, I was on the phone with Noah describing the situation. And the decision was you may not approach that pup. So we had to leave it there. Uh, the hardest part of that whole evaluation was explaining to the people who had gathered behind us. And of course, there's several of us with these Marine Mammal Center uh, logo sweatshirts that says rescue. And, and they're saying, why aren't you doing something? And, and the, the, the greater good decision was that going and approaching that pup could have done more damage to the rest of the group of Harper Seals. We did go back later that afternoon to the same spot and the crowd was gone, but so was the pup. And, and so we don't know what happened to it. But there are times that, that are sort of frustrating to us, but we understand the reasoning behind it, that we can't interact with a, an animal that would otherwise need to be rescued. So what happens to an animal once we decide that it needs to be rescued? It goes to the Marine Mammal Center for rehabilitation and or relocation. Uh, if, for example, it's an elephant seal that may be resting, but it's in the trail on Doran Beach from the parking lot to the beach, um, we may conclude that that's dangerous for both the animal and people to be on that trail. And in some cases, we can just use our herding boards to board it back into the water. Or we may decide that if it's a very busy Saturday afternoon <clears throat> and there are people all over the beach, we may, need, we may decide that we need to put it in a carrier and relocate it to a, to a less populated area. If it's relocated, if it's if it's under <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna go outside and do some work. <laughs> Listen, 
if, if it's going to, uh, to get rehabilitated, uh, it goes to the Marine Mammal Center, it's checked in. There is a website, on our website, there's a section called Current Patients. And you can go to that section and look up any animal that has gone into the Marine Mammal Center. And it will tell you what the status of that animal is. Uh, it, you know, one of the, 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 the sad parts of this process is that sometimes the conclusion is the animal cannot be saved and, and it does require euthanasia. And, and that requires uh, our vets to, to make that decision and, and actually perform that process. Um, <clears throat> and then there's another alternative, which is relocation. And, and relocation uh, uh, to uh, another facility that can care for the animal because we will occasionally get an animal that is uh, not able to return to the wild, but that we don't really want to euthanize. And so occasionally there will be places that will take um, uh, animals, for instance, sea lions that are blind or, or an animal that is missing an appendage. The that, desire to go outside is much greater and to go out. So you go outside and it's freezing? Okay. Well, maybe I'll hang the birds instead. Yeah. Um, somebody's we, not muted. Can we mute that? Yeah, somebody's not muted. I'm looking. Okay. It looks like everybody's muted now. So occasionally, we will end up placing an animal in a facility that can take an animal that will be good for, for education. So we talked before about what to do for non-marine mammals that we deal with. Uh, for entangled whales, uh, it's 1-800-767-9425. And we do have uh, people that are skilled and licensed to disentangle whales at the Marine Mammal Center. Uh, and for dead animals, the California Academy of Sciences and their number is there. When in doubt, call us at the Marine Mammal Center. If it's not something that we deal with, we will find the right people to notify and let them, let them know about the issue. And that's the end of my presentation. And I'll open it up again for any questions. Feel free to unmute yourselves to um, ask questions directly. So when it comes to dead marine mammals, um, who do we report? to if there's been like a clear violation. We found like several months ago, we found a uh, elephant seal on the beach that was uh, beginning to deteriorate and the carcass was intact except for the skull had been removed. Who, would, who should we have reported that to? Uh, that should go to the California Academy of Sciences. Okay. And, and, and Cal Academy, particularly with sea lions, but with other animals as well, may remove the skull when they come out. Uh, and, but if, they wouldn't leave the rest of the carcass, right? Or would they? Yes, they would. They would normally leave the rest of the carcass. Okay, okay. And, we, were, we were concerned about what had happened and whether the, the skull had been taken by um, a lucky Lou who decided it would be cool to have a skull. That, that's, 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 it. it's certainly possible. And, and the answer would come from California Academy of Sciences. Okay, thank you. And typically- hey, Cal, Acad Cal Academy normally marks an animal that they have seen on the beach and even if they've removed any parts or, or taken any tissue for necropsy by um, attaching a piece of green twine right. around to, one of the, to, to one of the, the flippers. One of the front flippers typically. Okay. Uh, and, and so, you know, I, when I see a, a carcass on the beach and I see a piece of tr green twine around one of the flippers, uh, I know that, that the uh, academy has been there. 
but sometimes that washes away. And, uh, you know, particularly as the carcass deteriorates. So if you have questions, uh, the Academy will know the answer. And Kate, um, a pink cloth tied around one of the flippers is an indication that one of the sanctuary's beach watch volunteers uh, surveying that beach has documented and uh, reported that animal to Cal Academy. But as Phil says, um, those pieces of twine and uh, cloth ties wash away all the time. Right. Okay. So if there's any doubt, call, call Cal Academy. Yeah, the carcass was pretty well deteriorated and it was it was um, some time ago when we had we had seen this, you know, it was like last year sometime when we were out on one of the state beaches, but just yeah, <laughs> always, always calling the academy is fine. And 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 if you don't have the academy's number and you know the Marine Mammal Center's number, call us. We'll get the information to the academy. Okay, thank you. We do work very closely with the academy. We, you know, they do the they're, they're they're responsible for the necropsies on on the animals that are that are found dead on the beaches but we will do them sometimes in our facility and they will come into our facility. Uh, we work very closely with them. If it's, if it's a whale, it's usually a team of Marine Mammal Center and Cal Academy people that go out to do the necropsy on the beach. So relationship is really good. Just get a hold of one of us and, and, and we'll work it out. Other questions? Thank, there's thank nothing you. else in the chat. Yeah, there's nothing else in the chat, Phil. Okay, thanks for your attendance. Thank you very much for presenting. Thank you, Phil, that was fascinating. Phil, is there, um, is there somewhere, if, if somebody has questions later, um, maybe they could forward them to me and I could send them on to you? Sure. I mean, you can always send them along to me. My, my email, uh, Hollis, you have my email, but it's phil at genewarren.com. And I will be glad to respond to any questions. Thanks so much. Questions always come up to me a few hours after the fact. <laughs> hey, so we're running ahead of schedule here and um, Ryan is going to log on at uh, close to 11.45 to talk to us about whale disentanglement. And before breaking for lunch, I'm wondering if we could um, go around the group and introduce ourselves and um, what we do at the coast and why we're here. I can't see everybody. Let's see if I can do another view here. If uh, Phil stops sharing screen, we can. It'll open back yeah, up. I'm, I'm trying. I'm trying to figure out how to do that right now. Go yeah. all the way to the bottom, <laughs> and in the middle there should be a green arrow that says "Share" or "Don't Share Screen." All the way to the bottom. Yeah, and I don't see that. And try the top too. Yeah, and it's the one that says "New Share," uh, but I don't want to do a new share. So. Okay, let's see if I can discontinue you as a co-host. Oh, okay. I've got a stop share here. Here you go. Oh, okay. There we yeah. go. We're good to go. Okay. Okay. So, Phil, how did you get interested in this? When, when we retired and moved to Bodega Bay, we, which was 15 or 18 years ago, I guess, we ended up taking a trip out to Cordell Bank uh, that was, I think, sponsored by Cal Academy, but they had a Marine Mammal Center docent on board. And we were thinking about, you know, what we're now retired, what would we like to do? And they said, oh, well, you know, we would love to have people come down to the center and work in the pens. And, and you know, when you start, you end up cleaning pens, but you get more chance to, to work with the animals. But we just moved out of Silicon Valley and we're thinking how great it was to be in Bodega Bay and not to have a lot of traffic and deciding, well, we don't really want to suddenly start driving down to, to Sausalito every couple of days. 
So I said, well, maybe we could use a rescue person on the coast. And it turned out the, the young lady named Lisa Valentine that worked out at the Marine Lab was the only trained volunteer along the whole Sonoma coast at the time. And so we kind of paired up with, with Lisa and started the rescue process. And as I said, we built up a, a team of 15 well-trained volunteers and another four that have just joined the group. So that's, that's how we got into it. And what kind, of, what kind of other volunteer opportunities are available to the Marine Mammal Center for, for care of animals, for example? Yeah, there's, there's, we need drivers. We need um, education volunteers. Uh, one of the nice things to have when we go out to do a rescue is to have someone that's dedicated to talking to the general public. Because I mean, when, when we get there, we try to set the scene because you, you may actually, the people who may have reported the animal may be waiting around. And there are other people that the animals attracted. So we end up talking to those people beforehand. But of course, our focus really needs to be, okay, we're now here. We need to deal with this animal. And so it's nice to have uh, someone whose primary focus is education to allow the rescuers to go ahead and, and deal with with the rescue and, and getting the animal into a carrier and, and into a vehicle. And at that time, we also stop and, and go back and, and talk with the, the, the people so that they understand what happened and what's gonna happen to the animal. Uh, and then there, there are, as I say, we've got 1400 volunteers. Uh, we've, we've, the, the facility in Sausalito was huge. And, and we need people who are willing to come in. Uh, sometimes, sometimes we run two or three shifts a day because some of these animals, particularly harbor, new harbor seal pups, need to be dealt with every few hours. And so we have people in, in during harbor seal pup season that are in the, uh, in the hospital. We have a separate hospital for harbor seal pups. Uh, and, and that hospital is manned 24 hours a day. The other hospital for the seals and sea lions, uh, usually by the time you do the last feeding in the evening, you can go home and come back in the morning and, and start again. But it does take a lot of people, a lot of dedicated people that, that enjoy working around marine mammals. What's the volume of rescues that you do in like a typical month? I'm it, it, sure it, there's... it varies dramatically. Uh, the, the number of animals in the center can go in the winter time from four or five in a December or January period to a April, May, June of 300 animals. Uh, and again, that's driven by pupping season. Uh, and, and, and so it, it, it depends. We have in, along the Sonoma coast, we can go a month without a report. And then in the middle of the summer, we can end up with two or three reports a day. So it's, yeah. it varies. And it varies, you know, the last, you know, when, when COVID started, our, our number of reports went down dramatically. And we, you know, said, oh, well, it must be because nobody's on the beach. And, and then, you know, a lot of people figured out that the beach is the best place to be. And so the beaches got very crowded, but our report numbers didn't go up. And, and so we don't know what happened, but uh, you know, the last couple of years, the ocean temperatures have been cooler. And, and maybe that means that there's less malnutrition. Uh, and, and so the numbers around here have been relatively low for the past couple of years. We're keeping our fingers crossed that they stay that way. Yeah. <laughs> 